Our next keynote speaker is the founder and chief technology officer of Zero Analytics, a social impact data analytics company. Co-founder din siya ng Data Ethics PH, an online community focused on social issues such as data privacy, data security, AI-driven discrimination, data liabilities, data ownership rights, and data poverty. He also co-founded the Analytics Association of the Philippines and is a board of trustees and member of the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. Malakam pa natin ang ating pangunawa sa artificial intelligence. Let's all give a warm welcome to Mr. Dominic Ligot. Thanks for the kind intro, Kara. You got my slides? So I was asked to talk about data journalism. But I felt compelled to add a slide after the previous talk. It's chill. How many of you know the word maximalist? Probably an alien word because we're used to minimalism. So maximalism is uh, actually an art technique. So I asked uh, one an AI image generator, show me journalist maximalism. And that's what it looks like. Here's another one. So the, the AI tool I used was Midjourney, which is one of the most popular, or probably the best at the moment, AI uh, image generator. If you look at these four photos, at least for me, one of the first things that I realized is that this AI is a little biased. I did not say any gender, but in its infinite wisdom, it considers at least three out of the four images when you say journalism. It's a man. Yeah, more on that later. So I'm going to talk about generative journalism. Uh, I'll break my talk into kind of four main parts. I want to jump off from the previous talk about just coming to grips with what we really mean by AI today. Then I'll go through specific use cases of how AI is actually being used in journalism already. And finally, uh, I think everyone loves the doom and gloom, so I'll come back to that also. So chill Muna, and then later we can go back to doom and glooms. First things first, uh, AI is not a new term. It's been around for a while, but I think the main term we're talking about now is generative uh, AI. So what does that mean? Up, up until recently, when people said AI, they meant discriminative AI, meaning this is AI that takes data and then gives you some sort of a conclusion or an outcome. So it interprets data. Now, AI does sort of the opposite. You give it data, and then it generates more data. So for example, in the discriminative era, you give a picture of a cat, AI will tell you that's a cat or not a cat, depending on the photo. Now you give a photo of a cat, the AI will create more cats or you give it the word cat and then it will create cats. So this is the AI I wanna focus on today. This is also what's driving a lot of the interest. And I guess the, the I guess the doom and gloom so we're either talking about uh, generative AI in the form of deepfakes or image generation like journey, or of course the ubiquitous chatbots now like ChatGPT, Bard, and all of these things. First thing I want to preface is uh, I think OpenAI's fault, I think, made a mistake by likening chatbots to search engines. And I think it is a wrong approach because unlike search engines, chatbots do not extract data from a database. So they actually create data from scratch based on patterns it remembers. And the problem here is those patterns may not be accurate. Well, they're accurate statistically, but they may not be factual. So that's the first thing to remember about the risks here. However, they perform very well when you give it existing data that you're already familiar with, data that you're vetting with, and then they interpret it. So that's essentially the bottom line of AI currently being used today, in, especially in journalism, AI is being used for content creation, for content analysis, and creating interactive content. I'll focus on these three things, but you see how, how practical. First, in terms of content creation, this presentation actually was half generated by AI. So I asked ChatGPT, can you give me a 10-slide outline 
for a generative AI in journalism. And that's what you've got. That's what I have here. That doesn't mean I, I trust it. At least it helped me organize my thoughts because I have a very strict 15 minute deadline. So I'll trust AI did my work for me. One of the most compelling uses of content creation is how AI can help create very complex content from seeming a little wrong. So this is a interesting app called Learning Studio AI. It basically creates a full course, an online course. So I give it a prompt. Uh, can you give me a course on using generative AI in classrooms? And after 90 seconds, it's a full course with chapters, with quizzes. Uh, and I think this is a shout out. I'm, I'm, I'm an academic as well. One of the biggest problems we have in education, not to mention media education, is the administrative load we have on our teachers. And we expect them to produce papers and teach. So this is an opportunity for AI to come in. So never mind students cheating in their essays. You know, that's another issue. But uh, teachers can speed up the creation time for their content. Analysis is a big deal. This is already a day-to-day -to -day task for me. Rather than reading articles in total, I actually asked ChatGPT, can you summarize this article for me in five bullets? And if you're in a newsroom or in a, in a fast-paced environment, you can't afford to be reading everything end-to-end. -end. This is a great shorthand. So this is what I was saying. Rather than relying on chatbots to create uh, original uh, material, which might be factually wrong, using them to summarize existing material, 100% really reliable. Here's an interesting one. This is a recent article on the Amazon uh, layoffs, and there was a strike. So it was a lengthy article, so Wired didn't have time to read it. So I said, can you summarize this text? Just copied it, put it in the chatbot. But then I gave it some bullets, basically the seven elements of story, you know, as it's taught. Give me the plot, give me the tone, give me the scene, give me the setting, the conflict, the characters, the POV. And, you know, in one click, you got it. So whether you want to focus on what was the central theme, the conflict of the article, who's the point of view, this can really speed up a lot of uh, productivity for people who want to, you know, just get on with the, the task at hand. Finally, I find this probably one of the most compelling uses, very mundane, but I don't know if you've heard of chat PDF. You know, it's a variant built on chat GBT. You just upload the PDF and you can talk to the PDF, basically. So here's an existing example. Are you familiar with the poem, this is the data, you know, massively among the blah, blah, blah. So I uploaded it. And then I started asking the Zidrata, you know, I'm sad. Can you give me you know, advice? And it gives me advice based on the poem. Or, hey, I'm going to be speaking in front of some journalists. What should I do to stay uh, calm and stable and, you know, uh, credible? You can have some advice based on the poem. So you can use this for research papers. You can use this for articles. And sometimes it aids. It's better to be conversational with material as opposed to, you know, reading it straight. Like, I can't read article straight without falling asleep after 30 minutes. No? But talking to a chatbot based on an article is really uh, useful. So where is this headed? This, this technology will not stop here. This is some of the stuff I've seen. I haven't checked all of them. There's a website called, there's an AI for that. So just take note of that. It's an AI that recommends AI. And they said, there's an AI for that. Give me AIs related to journalism. And here are the top four. So there's generative press. These are chatbots basically writing articles from Twitter posts. There's news writer, which is an automated press release writer. You just give the situation, what do you want to highlight, instant article. Uh, TLDR is an aggregator site. This summarizes all of the articles by category, so you can choose what field you want. And then on the lower right, probably the beginnings of it, I'm not sure if it works as well yet. How can you, how can you use AI to vet fake news? So this is an AI that ranks the trustworthiness of an article. No? So more on that later. So given all of these rather mundane, no, but very practical things, the promise of generative AI, I'll be positive with that for a change, productivity. You know, newsrooms are challenged, educators are challenged, and the only way you can alleviate that is a plus. Customization is another. Sometimes you need to write the same story, but under different angles, perspectives, AI can help with that. Research and development also, avoiding the trap of using AI like a, a search engine. You use it in conjunction with a search engine, or you use it in conjunction with research. And then finally, I think the name of the game now is really content creation. Everyone is challenged to produce content day in, day out, 24 hours. I found I'm actually quite active on social media now up until 
just up until recently, no, last month and a half, I've been producing webinars. AI has been an instrumental part of my content creation, no, and helped me kind of produce all the content I want, of course, within certain guidelines. Okay, so good. So now let's look at the challenges a bit, no? And I want to focus on the practical challenges, like the near-term ones, because these are the things that will probably hit you the moment you start uh, talking about AI. Uh, there's three. One is safety. Of course, copyright is another. And of course, the bug there is disinformation. On the safety front, even before generative AI, we have been challenged by basically automated tools going uh, bonkers now. Like, I'm sure you've used Waze. So... Waze for me is an essential tool. It helped me uh, get to Diliman from Asi in 15 minutes. But the use of Waze can be unreliable, like in these uh, two cases where the, the users of Waze, basically Israelis, led, Waze led them to a Palestinian camp unknowingly, and they got killed. No? Or in Brazil, this is Lumangus, um, a couple were vacationing in Rio de Janeiro. They misspelled the destination on Waze. And instead of a resort, they ended up in a slum and there was a gang war, they got shot. So is that the, is that the fault of Waze? I don't know. It's definitely a data issue. And this is now something we need to be wary of. The AI tools are only as good as the, as the data that's fed to them. So it's now a data quality becomes a social issue. Of course, we're not strangers to social media. And I'm sure everyone will agree, it's so polarized today. Like parents, you know, BDS versus loyalista versus whoever. There's a reason for this. Social media is a marketing tool. And number one in marketing is to segment audiences. So inadvertently, the polarization you see is actually a direct result of this segmentation mechanism. The algorithm wants us to be warring against each other because marketers want to target you for preferences. They just didn't realize that hate speech and genocide was a very effective uh, no, segmentation tool. And then something as uh, mundane as facial recognition, this was uh, two cases in the UK uh, where passports couldn't be obtained by ethnic, uh, ethnic minorities. Why? Because the facial recognition system was trained on Caucasians. So see, Richard Lee couldn't get a passport because the algorithm thought his eyes were closed. And see, Joshua Bad couldn't get a passport because the algorithm thought his mouth was wide open. But the bottom line was, just couldn't read their faces properly. So this issue of misclassification, it's still there. Of course, researchers try their best to, uh, have you seen this? Poppy or, no, Chihuahua or Raisin Bread and puppy or bagel, it is a reality. And we're not trained to work with tools that have a probability of error. Like, would you deal with a refrigerator that had a 0.1% chance of heating your food instead of cooling it? No, uh, we're not used to that. But that's how AI works. This is a little more abstract. This is what people everywhere worry about. Whenever you automate a system, there's a chance the system doesn't understand what you want it to do. So this is an example of an AI uh, agent playing a game and it was given a task, maximize the score. It's actually a bird going around the racetrack. And what it figured out was the best way to maximize the score was never to finish the course, but to keep picking up the bonus items. So it didn't accomplish what the modelers want, but it accomplished the goal. No? The abstract one I keep talking about is what if you have an AI that runs a hospital and you give it a goal? It's minimize the cases of cancer. And the AI might just say, okay, I'm just going to kill all the cancer patients and minimize cancer. This is a very abstract problem. It's a computer science issue for a long time. But now it's becoming reality because of these tools. The other thing we need to be wary of is how we interact with these tools. We're not used to uh, AI that generates data. Like uh, someone committed suicide talking to a chatbot because chatbot was depressing. Uh, someone married the chatbot. I didn't know that was possible. Uh, because uh, she felt, the, the woman who married the chatbot, she felt comforted with the chatbot. She suffered a heartbreak recently and the chatbot knew exactly what the tell her. Copyright is a kind of a tricky issue now. Because the laws are rather kind of gray. There's law, for example, on derivative works, which you have a copyright on, but the basis for that work should have been licensed. But when you train a model on a work, is that tantamount of copying? Question mark. Like in this case, by getting images, there's the suing stability AI, because clearly this image on the right was inspired by the left. Unfortunately, nasama yung logo ng the images on the bottom, little garbled. So that's where it could uh, be tricky, you know? 
And of course, the satire versus disinformation. Uh, image on the left, Biden having a talk in Divisoria, uh, was generated for fun. But what if you didn't know who Biden was? You would really think he's walking around in Divisoria. And then these images on the right, very recently were protests in, in France. Uh, and these uh, images were generated allegedly from that protest, except the glove had six fingers. So you know that that wasn't a true glove. Uh, but the AI is getting better. This is an existing exercise we did in our lab a few years ago. Uh, we just got an original video and then superimposed spaces on it. The question here is, we may be at a point where we don't trust video anymore. And that has legal and creative implications. All right, I think I'm near my 1441. 20 seconds. Uh, there, there's a really uh, problem now in the global arena. No one knows or agrees how to regulate this stuff. So in, within one week of each other, Japan said copyright won't be an issue for AI, but the EU released copyright rules. And then Stanford made a kind of a study. If we look at all of the major AI vendors right now, in AI, Google, etc., and then ran them against the EU Act that was recently drafted, how many of them do you think would pass? Zero, no? And in fact, the rules on copyright, you can read this, are one of the most flagrantly ignored, right? So what are the takeaways? Um, chill, and then generative AI can really improve journalism, can really improve education from a productivity and interactivity and research perspective. But we need to come back to bottom line, research ethics, media ethics, journalistic integrity. I'll be the first to tell you, because I kind of have a foot in both uh, journalism and tech, uh, there's this interesting divide between journalists and technologists. No? Uh, it's just incidental. I think we need to start merging the two fields because journalists use technology a lot. And we cannot wait for regulation. I'll be the first to tell you that. Regularly, I'll be you what happens when a disaster has already occurred. Like the UN Declaration of Human Rights occurred after World War II. We really want to wait for World War II before we start getting our act together. Probably not. So in summary, uh, we talked about generative AI in journalism, ethical considerations. So before I talk, I just want to shout, uh, please follow me on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. I actually became quite active in social media just about uh, a month and a half ago because it seems like we have a shortage of people talking about AI. So I'm putting out friendly, non-technical content. Uh, every week I have a webinar uh, that I run called AI for Lunch. The episode this Saturday will be about journalism and disinformation. And then I have an open invitation. If you need a speaker, one hour, quick briefing, no cost. I'm happy to oblige face-to-face -face or, uh, no, or uh, video, TikTok. And then um, I've already done five webinars. So the sixth will be this Saturday. You can find it all on my YouTube channel. And then we will soon be releasing, this is my company, I run an AI company and we do use case design. I think we don't have a shortage of tech uh, implementers and talent. I think we have a shortage of ideas. So if you are interested in your organization, this is agnostic of field and uh, industry, but you need help incubating ideas for AI, more than happy to, to help. So that's my talk. Thank you very much and looking forward to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Oh, Dominic, what's the number? No, ha? Sakto, 15 minutes. But I don't know what the number is, Mama. Yeah. All right. Hindi ko na alam, parang lunar coaster of emotions na ako. Kanina po nakikinig, parang napaka-hopeful ko na kanina pagkatapos ko pakinggan si Jim. Tapos nang nagsalita si Dominic, hindi ko alam kung mag-chill ba ako, natatakot ba ako, hindi ko na naibigyan. Kasi sa simula, parang ang kalindigin ng AI. Pero on the other hand, shucks, baka may nalang ako ng trabaho, mas magaling ako siya mag-summarize sa akin. <laughs> baka mas magaling din yung drama niya sa akin. Pero very interesting yung sinabi ni Dominic sa atin. Yes, we can use AI. It will increase our productivity. Mas mag-customize natin yung mga storya natin. Matutulungan tayo with research and development and content creation. Pero just like any other technology, no challenges po ito. The challenge of safety, copyright, disinformation, and, and bias. Hmm. All right. Pero at the end of the day, 
dapat mas intindihin natin itong technology na ito para lalo natin siyang mas. So all our keynote speakers, and now we have come to the exciting part, the panel discussion. Ngayon pa lang may mga nakutuhan na akong questions from Zoom, from YouTube, from Facebook, and from our live audience here at PCC, PSSC. Um, may we invite our speakers on Zoom, Mr. Joe Hironaka from UNESCO Bangkok and Jean Leonis Dinko from the University of New, University of New South Wales, Canberra to switch on their camera. And for our speakers who are present here at the PSSC Auditorium, please join us on stage. Dominic Ligot from Cyrenotics, Dr. Didi Rodrigo from Ateneo, and Dr. Nelly Turnia from the University of the Philippines. Ayan. Meron na po akong mga questions na nandatanggap nito. Is Mr. Joe Nata? Yeah, yeah, I can see them. All right. So this is a question for Mr. Hironaka. This is a question from Zoom from Wilson Pavilion. So Joe, what are some of the important recommendations that UNESCO could give to government and non-government policymakers regarding the safety and privacy issues related to AI at the present? Can you hear me? Uh, hello. Uh, I'd appreciate if I could repeat I that in writing. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't understand it. It was garbled. I'm afraid. Sorry. I will repeat the question, sir. This is from Mr. Padillon via Zoom. What are some of the important recommendations that UNESCO could give to government and non-government organizations, uh, NGO policymakers? Regarding the safety and privacy issues related to AI at the present, important recommendations for policy mem policy makers regarding AI and data privacy issues. Um, th th thank you. I'm going to um, uh, interpret what I heard from uh, what I think I understood, which is. Um, uh, what practical tools we have um, to, well, this is my interpretation, to ensure that the uh, normative instrument, a normative instrument is um, is an international law or framework adopted by the 193 member states of UNESCO. Um, and there is one for the ethics of AI, yeah. And uh, within that um, framework, it, there are a number of mechanisms um, to support um, uh, the application, the, you know, the, the transfer of, of, of these recommendations into national legislation. As I, as I think I said, there are around 30 countries already working on that. And, and one way to think about um, a UNESCO recommendation is um, at some level, like a in, this is kind of UN trivia, uh, but but at some level, a recommendation is is um, uh, a higher level than a declaration, including the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The reason that the Universal Declaration um, is so considered so powerful is because it was um, turned into national legislations in virtually all countries. So that's that's the ultimate um, goal. Um, in terms of the elaboration of these frameworks, um, very much it's the NGOs and CSOs and other partners that are involved. And in a similar way, the guidelines for social media, uh, which um, uh, my colleagues are working very closely on, uh, we circulated three, three versions. We received tens of thousands, I think, of, of, of feedback. Um, and I see constantly in my email um, um, you know, um, uh, specific uh, requests and petitions from different NGOs in this region, and so on. So uh, th those are uh, those are by nature what UNESCO does as a convening organization of the UN on, on these matters. Um, something we take uh, on on board. It's extremely valuable. Um, I think the comments on the social media guidelines um, have closed. Uh, actually, yesterday. Um, I don't know if I don't know if there are other ways to to influence the process, but I I, I strongly encourage every 
concerned NGO to really engage with UNESCO's intergovernmental process. It is possible. Um, I hope I didn't miss the point of the question, or I wasn't trying to dodge it. I, I really couldn't quite understand what um, um, what was being asked. Thank you very much. Um, maybe our panel would like to add to that. Um, kasi yung din yung sa slide po ng results natin na, na kailangan i-prioritize natin yung awareness on AI ethics. Ano pa sa tingin ninyo yung mga um, recommendations na kailangan para sa mga policy makers natin para mas ma-insure yung safety um, lalo na yung may privacy issues tayo related to AI and the present. Sige, Doc. I can add. Hello. Yeah, okay. it's working. Um, see, uh, Professor Hilo mentioned already that there are existing laws. Uh, Data Privacy Act is one, RA10173. There's also the Cybercrime Prevention Act, the RA10175. Uh, and already for you know redress no if you have uh, issues. I think the, the problem is uh, wide awareness amongst for people who had their, their Facebook thing hacked, many of them don't know that you can really go to the police and report it. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, like, I, I personally experienced uh, an identity theft uh, recently, you know, a training provider used my face to sell their training courses. And we're escalating that first to the Privacy Commission and also as a cybercrime. That's one. Um, the, 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 I think the, the broader issue now is, okay, beyond that, because well, there's no a mention of AI in either of those laws. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, now we need to have, I, I think, a, a very explicit dialogue with lawmakers. There's actually three bills being ano, uh, proposed right now. Senator Marcos wants to propose a bill on jobs. C. Salceda wants to propose a bill on copyright, and C. Barbers wants an AI agency. I think my, my first recommendation there is please consult academia, please consult private sector, don't, don't regulate in a bubble. I'm not saying they, they are. Um, and then finally, you can also get inspired by existing structures, like uh, the Privacy Act has this thing called the Privacy Impact Assessment. It's not a requirement. But if you're going to procure, let's say, data systems, uh, it's almost always a requirement already. Not so much to parang restrict, but at least if something blows up, you have accountability. Sino ba nag, who signed this thing and who cleared it? And then uh, at the same time, there's these things called the ISO standards. So it's not so much uh, parang a punishment, but more of a, a standard. Now, okay, if you want to implement good quality systems, you have to comply with ISO 9000. And that also becomes a procurement requirement. We don't have that for AI right now. But okay. something, something could be done to that. So, so in other words, um, Sir Dominic, um, like what Sir Joe said a while ago, that the um, social media guidelines, guidelines on, um, so as far as social media is concerned, and this can be applied also to AI. Yung nga lang, at least here in the Philippines, we have already laws in place. It's just that hindi lang nakasulat black and white that this, could, that this is AI related, but it could be used also for for AI technologies. Yes, Dr. Perlman. Uh, yes, and in addition, and this is where the academe, as well as associations like the PCS and other uh, you know, uh, academic and uh, professional organizations come into play, is to work with these uh, policymakers. You know, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, educate them and educate the public about you know how uh, what exists, what guidelines, uh, okay. what, what other uh, potential areas you know, uh, should be included when it comes to policy and lawmaking. Thank you, thank you. Um, we have another question for, for Jean. Jean, are you still there? Um, the question is from Zoom, um, from uh, Josefina Lakai. The question is, what measures could, could be adopted or implemented for AI not to be abused? Are you there, Jean? Hello, hello. Hi, Jean. This is a question for you. Um, what measures, this is from Zoom, one of our Zoom viewers, Josefina Lakai. She's asking what measures could be adopted or implemented for AI not to be abused? Uh, great. Uh, thank you. 
So I'd first I'd like to acknowledge that while AI definitely can bring about significant benefits, especially in sectors like public services, you know, healthcare, there's one question about healthcare a while ago and education, there is also a risk of a lot of misuse and abuse. And that's a good question considering that there's a lot of things happening at the moment. First, um, I think um, Dr. Ligut mentioned um, a while ago that there is a, a need for transparency. You know, AIs or the systems that we have now should operate transparently with clear explanations of how decisions are made. But most of the time it's open just, you know, they just go back to us and say that it's a block box. And this is essentially for trust and accountability, especially when technology like this is used in high stakes areas like healthcare or law enforcement, where, hmm. you know, you police um, certain uh, communities because Training data suggests that most of the crimes happen there, and that's not fair, and that's very discriminatory. And uh, th these technologies also should not be should not reinforce or exacerbate existing biases or inequalities. So there's a lot of measures that could be done, including audits, diverse or representative training data, and the involvement of diverse stakeholders in in AI development and, and deployment. And there's another two that I would like to pinpoint, which I mentioned a while ago, is accountability. You know, if something goes wrong with the system, there's no clear policy on who should be responsible. And this could involve a lot of legal and regulatory measures to ensure accountability for both the developer and the users. And then the human oversights to ensure that the systems do not operate beyond human control. There should be provisions for meaningful human oversights and the ability to intervene and override um, systems when necessary. You know, we are always very, very quick to jump into this kind of scenarios and say that, oh, we're going to be removing humans on the loop because we don't need them and whatnot and so whatsoever. But then when things um, go uh, astray, you'll, you'll see that <laughs> most of the things could have prevented if there's actually human um, on the loop. Yeah, right. Thank you, Jean. Um, so, um, meron din tanong dito, um, kasi we're now talking about um, AI being abused by certain sectors. So, but in actually, yung mga questions dito, na, ito yung sinasabi ni Don kanina na nag-blower, di ba? May, um, may tanong din dito, Don, para sa'yo, how do you see AI being recognized against journalists and being used for political operations? Yeah, so obviously the content creation is prone to abuse. And I think I'll be the first to say, while you can use AI to generate content, uh, the practice of using AI to kind of detect bad content or, or fake content, it's still an emerging practice. Uh, there is no perfect solution yet. So that's the first area where journalists need to be careful because you can literally ask a chatbot, please write this article in the style of Cara David and then use Cara David's deepfake. And then now it's your, your word against the, the digital Cara David's word. No, that's, <laughs> that's a problem. And we're, and we're not only talking about written content. I did a demo earlier. There's already voice AI. There's video AI uh, that's, that can clone your voice. So I think we're... Okay, um, what do we do now? Understand why you can you can say chill. Don't have any more than you know. You can say you chill, chill, and it's like chill and then. Okay, okay. See, I'll I'll try to attack it first philosophically. Um, when we say ethics, it doesn't mean follow the law, lang. Because mm -hmm. the law happens when disasters occur, and then the lawmakers figure out something. Ethics is proactive. We need to teach right. that in school. Do the right thing. Right. Yeah. yourselves. Um, right. So, yeah, baseline. And then moving on top of that, uh, my, my it's not foolproof, but my first uh, defense up, uh, on like spotting fakes or disinformation is always the intent. And sometimes in the noise of social media, it's hard to surface intent. But when you see articles attacking someone or trying to make someone's reputation look bad, that's usually not kosher for normal news, no? Maybe on opinion columns, potentially, and then there are also what we call the hack, uh, what do you call this hatchet, <laughs> the hatchet writers. 
pero that should not be considered uh, you know on the same level as reporting no uh, unfortunately social media doesn't distinguish and you'll see an opinion column and news at the same level so maybe that's an opportunity for us how do we add this stuff better how do we report it better and we haven't actually brought to bear there is the accountability of the platforms themselves they're always a slippery fish i'm talking about facebook and google and twitter because they're global uh, but they have representative offices here there have been countries that have fined facebook Mm -hmm. and twitter you know we can afford it for sure but yeah we have to at least show citizens na may weapons that we can make them accountable so that's second probably the third is this is an open challenge to our students to our faculty just because we don't have existing tools right now that can fight this information effectively doesn't mean you can't create one so we can't just be a passenger in this discussion yeah. mm -hmm. let's innovate you know and this is what i was saying earlier but di magusap po siya journalists programmers scientists because we're all siloed even here in the up uh this is an opportunity for all of us we don't have to be the passenger in this in this fight we can be part of the driver you're all right uh thanks dom um what do you do since the pag-uusapan na rin natin yung abuse how and yung mga iba't ibang sectors that may possible abuse of, of, of ai about in the education sector um ano daw yung mga posibleng abuse ng ai at ano yung pwede natin gawin okay i think um for uh, the, the obvious things are, are uh, students using something like chat gpt to generate their essays and right that. and um i've had actually there, there have been three instances already when people have written me saying can i please have a copy of your paper entitled xyz and and i write them back and i say i don't think you I, I think you have the wrong person i've never i, I don't I, I did not write a paper with that title. And then they've said, oh, we got it from chat GPT. I'm like, what is, what is happening? Um, anyway, but, but aside from that, I think as educators, uh, we have to be really much more creative with our assessments. Um, we have to go back to maybe looking for, uh, looking at process, not just product. It's a lot more time consuming, unfortunately, but, you know, if you can break up your requirements into stages where you can actually vet each deliverable um, as it progresses mm -hmm. and as it develops and that that's one way to guard against it i think um the other thing which which actually relates to generative ai um because i have friends in the creative arts as well who do design and who do illustration and um the the, the challenges with generative ai is that uh, again, it's it's the ethical sourcing of data. Yeah. No. Um, the these these um, AIs were trained on publicly accessible images, but the original creators of the images were not credited. They were not uh, asked for their consent. Mm. They were not compensated for any of the of for the use of their images. Um, and so, the, as a result, because the data was not ethically sourced, the product is questionable, right? Mm -hmm. And so, this is something we hope to communicate to our students. And what what we do is that um, is that we 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 allow the use of these things to maybe generate ideas, but not to complete the the ideas. And then again, um, finally, if you look at this, the realm of publication. A lot of big publishers have already uh, right. issued statements about when you may and may not use generative AI, and I think the consensus is you can use it to to style check, to to check mm. grammar and so on, grammarly, but you cannot use it to write actually. Okay, I'm um, still on the on the topic of uh, the education sector, Doctor Pena, comfortable na ba kayo sa pagcreate ng policies and protocols on the national level in the use of AI in Philippine classrooms? <laughs> Uh, what do you mean? Should it be uh, generated by chat? Yes, yes. yes. These discussions, I know, uh, we, uh, we follow from uh, from schools, from students, and then upwards to chat, as well as from uh, from that downwards. So, uh, so I, I suppose that the discussions will emanate because of these various because of these various guidelines will emanate from these various discussions, whether they are bottom up. Or mm -hmm. downward, uh, going down to the level. Uh, and in addition, uh, one of the things as academics that we should consider is really the process of developing curricula. You know, uh, as we know, 
uh, developing curricula does take a long time. And as we have experienced, technology outpaces, you know, sometimes this process. So there must be uh, some way uh, that these emerging issues now, uh, are, are built in into discussions. No, uh, should they uh, find themselves in syllabi? Yes, I think that's a faster route rather than overhauling, you know, the curricula. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, we have a question for all our panelists. Um, let me start with uh, Mr. Hironaka. Joy, are you still there? Yes, Joe. Here's the question. Uh, do you agree that AI should be regulated? And if yes, what mechanisms can you propose for this? Do you agree that AI should be regulated? Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, thank you for the uh, question. Um, uh, well, that's a very difficult question to ask a, a member of the UN Secretariat because we we um, we act on the on the will of all our member states, um, and clearly, all our member states unanimously um, supported the development of recommendations on AI ethics, and we'd like to see that process um, uh, uh, turned into concrete legislation at national levels um, but it would no not normally be my place to say whether these should things should happen or not um, although it's true that um, we convene and encourage this type of normative instrument particularly in human rights yeah thank you thanks um jean would you like to comment on that do you agree that i should be regulated and if yes what mechanisms can we propose for this um, hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, AI technology, you know, akin to many other technological advancement does not hold transformative, uh, transformative potential, but it's definitely crucial to recognize that its use and the development should be gu uh, guided by the principles that prioritize the well-being of all people, you know, especially uh, the most vulnerable, um, you know, such as the workers, um, unfettered application of this kind of technology can definitely inadvertently lead to job displacement, job displacement, uh, income inequality, and an increased power dis uh, disparities. So yes, AI should be regulated, and this regulation does not mean that it will stifle innovation or progress. You know, quite the opposite, actually. In fact, consider the invention of mo um, of cars. You know, when they were first introduced, they were brought out brought about um, profound changes in the society offering unprecedented speed and mobility. However, they also introduced new risks and challenges like accident and fatalities. And it was not until the introduction of seatbelts, um, which is a form of regulation, if you, you will, that we could truly start to mitigate um, this risk uh, less. So the introduction of seatbelt, for instance, did not stop the growth or development of automotive industry. On the contrary, it made cars safer and thus more appealing to potential users. And then the rules were there not to limit growth, but to guide it in a direction that was more beneficial to society at large. So regulation um, in this case would work towards ensuring a fair distribution of the AI's benefit. You know, it could involve creating new job opportunities for those displaced by the technology or establishing standards in the tech industry. It's also about making sure the progress isn't leaving anyone behind and creating a wider gap between different classes of the society. Nice, nice. Thanks, Jean. Um, may you just put on the comment from our panel here in PSSC. Sigedom. See, I'll jump on the car analogy. So... Uh, you have two main occupations in cars. No? Uh, you have the mechanic and you have the driver. We license drivers, but we don't necessarily license mechanics. So food for thought. No? And a mechanic can fix the car. doesn't mean they can drive. And the other way around, you can be a Formula One driver. doesn't mean you can change a spark plug. So what's the difference between a mechanic and a uh, driver? The driver can kill. If they are drunk driving or they make a mistake or they press the accelerator instead of the brake, somebody could die. So on a fundamental level, in my view, if something is potentially harmful, we have to regulate it. But now we have to kind of nuance that. No? The reason why mechanics don't need necessarily uh, a license is they don't necessarily use the vehicle that could create the uh, problem. So 
potentially there, there's that logic. If you're a builder of AI, if you're a researcher of AI, you don't necessarily need to be restricted on research. But if you will be implementing AI or implementing systems, similarly, we have a privacy impact assessment. Maybe yeah. we need an AI impact assessment. Okay, set that aside. The big fear is always losing out on innovation. In that. And actually, that I think that's a misnomer because it's really fear of the monopoly. Because right now, you only have like so many companies who actually develop these big models that's a lot of power concentrated in the hands of a few uh, companies. That's actually the bigger challenge. And that's solely in the jurisdiction of the United States. Mm -hmm. So before we even think about regulating AI, how come we are not able to regulate Facebook? Mm -hmm. I'll give you an even more thought-provoking issue. Almost every government agency, local and national, without, with a few exceptions, have a Facebook page. Because... Right. Logically, it's the, it's the easiest way to get in touch with citizens. They've taken the place of the website or the hotline. Facebook never went through a procurement process for that. So if there's something that goes wrong, down on page ng Pasig, no liability. So who gave Facebook the permission to become the sole hotline for the government? No? And I think this is a problem, not necessarily with Facebook per se, but actually it's a government issue. Why did we allow Facebook so much power? So that's an open-ended question. I think that needs a bit more debate. Uh, but again, you can't regulate Facebook, forget about regulating AI. But again, on a more fundamental level, if it's harmful, potentially harmful, we have to, we have to put some rules uh, on it. Right. We really just... Uh... Scratching on the surface right now. Ang, ang lalim kasi social media pa lang, hindi pa tayo masyadong handa pa lang. Dumating na yung revolution ng social media, hindi pa tayo handa with our policies and regulations. Now, the AI is here pa. Um, malapit lang na 4 o'clock, so ibig sabihin, uh, we are about to end our panel discussion. But let me just show you the final slide of results, yung, yung ating tool kanina from our, from our uh, viewers. Um, so I would have a Facebook communication budget of international competitiveness that AI powered future. Um, the number one answer was adaptability and innovativeness. And it really naman yung you know, you know, um, we discussed ng ating, yung ng ating uh, mga speakers that we need to adapt to this technology pero hindi ibig sabihin ito sabi nga ni Dominic na, na ano na lang tayo, passive na lang tayo hindi pa na passengers na lang tayo we should be drivers as well so innovativeness is very important nandiyan din yung word na collaboration and also the words policies, practices and platforms now for our multiple choice um, Questions: What do you think must be the priority in order to establish the basic conditions to integrate AI in communication and media education? Almost half of our respondents chose awareness on AI ethics. So ethics is really, really very important. All important. Coming in second, build infrastructures to support stable internet connectivity. And finally, our last question, do you think that with the help of AI, we will achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030? 83% of our viewers said yes. Now, that's very hopeful. Okay, so we only have one, uh, time for one last question. It's a fast round for everyone. I would like to ask the, the panel. This is the question. How can we break through access barriers to AI in education for vulnerable groups such as impoverished young girls in third world countries like the Philippines? I, I, I just repeat the question. For our keynote speakers um, via Zoom, who are joining us via Zoom, how can we break through access barriers to AI in education for vulnerable groups such as impoverished young girls in third world countries like the Philippines? So while our our uh, speakers are are composing their their answers in their head, I'm just um, I'd like to get your eyes on the screen for our evaluation poll. To our Zoom attendees, please take this moment to answer a quick poll of just five questions to show our panel our great appreciation. They have graciously taken the time from the very hectic schedules to be with us today. So, pakisagot lang po. We will leave this poll open. 
this is the um, evaluation form for our panelists. Ayan, tignan mo. The panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge on the topic. Wow, overwhelming random na ng mga sagot. 87% uh, said strongly agree. All right. So while everyone is answering the evaluation poll for our keynote speakers, let me now ask our, our keynote speakers um, their thoughts on how can we break through access barriers to AI in education for vulnerable groups, such as impoverished young girls in third world countries like the Philippines. Maybe we can start with anyone here in the panel? Sige, Dr. Rodrigo. I, I think the one of the very first steps is really a massive infusion of investment in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, without the infrastructure, there is no AI. Right. Thank you, Dr. Rodrigo. Um, Dr. Peña, uh, well, together with infrastructure, then you have the soft inf infrastructure, which is education. Yes. You know, uh, so uh, in the same way that there is free basic education and free tertiary education, as well as alternative learning systems, then these are the things that have to be built in. Uh, responsible use of media, responsible use of uh, uh, social media, and then digital uh, education. Uh, mm -hmm. among others. Uh, and I'd also like to pick up from what uh, uh, Joe Hironaka said a little while ago, that diversity works. Yes, uh, yes. Diversity works. So the more voices that are heard, you know, from minority groups, but of course, then, you know, you need, a, you need the hardware for them to latch on. But greater diversity is really good uh, in the long run, uh, whether it is for democratic systems or right. for developing leadership. Right. And then maybe here from, from Joe, from Joe first, um, the question is, how can we break through access barriers to AI and education for vulnerable groups such as impoverished young girls in certain countries like the Philippines? Thank you. Um, that's probably the most important question to address at this time. I'll try to be very concise. Um, I agree. I agree fundamentally that it's connectivity and the way the UN works. Um, um, UNESCO itself doesn't deal with uh, uh, the infrastructure of connectivity, um, but we deal with the digital skills, the media and information literacy, and I think that's just as important as making an internet connection to a school. Um, yeah. uh, and as far as you know, this, this inflection point where we are with with uh, natural language models uh, and the ability to to translate fairly accurately news where um, where a, a journalist um, can do the final work um, it's I, you know I, I would really emphasize this point about about language diversity you, UNESCO my my boss um, um, has ca called on a thousand languages to be online at this moment I think Facebook has, Less than two hundred, and as I said, it's it's a, and it's um, it's feasible within this decade. This is the decade of in uh, the UN decade for indigenous languages, and I hope um, many of the participants today will look at it this way. You know, and the and the um, this use case, and 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 I think you know the, what. Uh, to the extent that it diversifies and extends audiences by creating different language versions, for instance, of Rappler or whatever. I think I think there's a, there's merit in exploring it both economically and also because it's the right right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Joe. Um, may we now hear from Jean? Um, for I, I guess I would like to reiterate um, that um, education should be viewed as or you know education, including access to digital and AI enabled education, is a fundamental right rather than a commodity. That's the first start. And in a society where access to education is seen as a basic right rather than a luxury, uh, the government and the society as a whole have a collective responsibility to ensure that everyone, irrespective of their social and economic background, has equal access to quality education. And that will include ensuring access to advanced tools like AI and enabled learning platforms, especially for the most uh, marginalized and, and vulnerable. And education, as I've said, should not be viewed as a commodity to be bought and sold, but as a public good, freely available to all regardless of their economic status. And this perspective 
pushes against the neoliberal tendency to privatize education, turning it into a product for consumption rather than a means for individual and societal transformation. Thank you very much. Very powerful, powerful words. Thank you very much, Jean, for those words. Um, and now we want to hear from, from Dominic. Okay. Same question. Uh, four steps. Um, if I'm not mistaken, a Starlink dish, 30,000. So 3 million will get 100 dishes. Can we donate 100 dishes? Scatter it all over the place. So that helps with the access. Um, we have, I don't know how many major languages, let's say 15 languages, one per region, I'm sure there are more. So 15 people who can translate, then use AI to do the courses, okay? Then finally, I think this is the most crucial, there has to be government support for really bringing that education to the kind of the least uh, served uh, areas of the country. Did you know that in 2019, Finland made a decision to train 1% of their population in AI? They did it in one year. Finland. So they have about 5 million citizens, so they trained 50,000. Um, now they're tackling the entire European Union. It's a little bigger, half a billion, so 5 million people. For us, the equivalent is about a million, about 100 million Filipinos. Uh, up until recently, I was personally involved in a project called Sparta. This was funded by DOST, and we actually trained almost 50,000 people in data science and analytics. It's not 1% of the population. So in other words, we might be over bloating the challenge, but actually we have a lot of private sector foundations, we have a lot of NGOs who could probably do it. I think somebody just has to say, here's the checklist, donate the Starlink dishes, get the volunteers. Actually, don't even have to be volunteers. They can be paid. You know, this should be a viable job for people. Uh, and then, balikan ko kay Dr. Pernia. Um, we're too focused on training end users. We need to train more teachers and we need to train more innovators. Uh, I think uh, having a call center industry was both uh, a boon and, a, and a, I guess a curse because it created a new middle class after 20 years, but now everyone wants to be an employee. I think we need more people who are willing to take a risk. But I think it goes back to education. Mm -hmm. So yeah, get the dishes out, get the translations out, use AI to create the content, and then government provides the support. Let's just use Finland as a good model. Probably by the time this administration's term will end, there is a movement in that respect. Thank you, thank you. We'd like to thank all our speakers. Mr. Joe Hironaka, thank you very much. Jean Lewis, being thought.